Uh, I'm glad, I'm glad, uh, thankful, uh, Ruth, for welcoming everybody today, especially our missionaries from the West End who have come down to, to join us, uh, to join us in our, our, our time of celebrating here, to take, take it in, take it in, West Enders, only, only one more week left, uh, one more week left, so, um, missions trip nearly, nearly over, and this week in the snow, wow, how, how fun is that, how fun is that, yeah, uh, Commuting in the snow, fun times. Anyway, so two weeks ago we, we opened up here and we, we launched uh, Rio South Side. And um, during that Sunday, I, I know that you remember everything I say, but just in case, um, we, we spoke about Isaiah 61 and, and God's um, positioning of us as a church now, not only in one location, but now, now in, in two locations. And I talked about in Isaiah 61 our calling to be a, a people and a church who rebuild and restore and renew uh, lives that are, are struggling, that are broken, that need, that need God's help. And, um, and we talked about how uh, we want to be a people who are inviting, inviting people that we know who are, are suffering or feeling in hopeless places to come here so that we can pray for them, so that we can bring their situations before God and ideally see miracles take place in their life instantly, but definitely bring their situation before God to see His active work and His breakthrough in their lives. Now, I know that God has an incredible love and compassion for, for our, our city, for the, for the people in, in our city, and I, I believe He has placed us here and also in the place that we've been in Pardic uh, for, for reasons to, to have a, a very obvious, um, a very obvious uh, love, love mission in, in, in these areas. So I believe you're here for a reason. I believe that you're part of this church for, for a reason. And I believe we're located where we are for reasons. And it's about bringing God's love. We're in a series entitled Make a Difference. Uh, make a difference, learning to follow God well. We have been, uh, we have been looking at three people uh, in the book of 1 Samuel. We looked at a woman named Hannah. We looked at a, a, a man named Samuel. And now we're looking at a king named Saul. And, and all three of these people's lives have been instructive in teaching us how we as a people, as a church, but also as individuals, how we can make a difference in our city. How we can make a difference in the, in the occupations that God's placed in, the universities that God's placed in, and the families that God's placed in. Uh, how we can make a difference uh, by learning to follow Him, uh, follow God well. So a few weeks ago, we saw that uh, Samuel secretly anointed this guy named Saul to be king. Nobody else knew about it, just he and Saul. Uh, then last, last week we saw how Samuel brings out Saul and announces to the nation that Saul is God's chosen king. So uh, God's, God's chosen king, he, he's the one, and then they all say, long live the king, and then people... Um, some people uh, whose hearts were moved by God, those people uh, followed him, but other people despised him. So the first time Saul was anointed king and nobody knew. Second time Saul was proclaimed king, not everybody followed him. And today we're going to be looking at the story where Saul finally sees this full nation buy-in to his leadership. Full nation, uh, the full nation gets behind his kingship, and that's the story that's going on. But it's the way that Saul goes about doing it that we're going to find our lesson today. It's, it's the, the way that he does it is, is where we're going we're gonna to learn. Today we're going to talk about making a difference, learning to follow God well in helping people who need rescue and the results that can come from helping people well as we follow God. That's, that's where we're going to go for today. Um, if you have your Bibles, I'm in 1 Samuel chapter 11. This, the words will be on the screen. There's a good chance they're going to be large enough to be read. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 11. Okay, so I'm just going to start reading in the first couple verses. Oh, yeah, they are big enough. Okay. Uh, first chap 1 Samuel chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Nahash the Amorite. Nahash the Amorite came up and and laid siege to Jabesh Gilead. All the men of Jabesh said to him, Make a treaty with us and we will serve you. Nahash the Amorite replied, I'll make one with you on this condition 
that I gouge out everyone's right eye and humiliate all Israel. <laughs> Don't do anything to us for seven days, the elder of Jabesh uh, said to him, and let us send messengers throughout the territory of Israel. If no one saves us, we will surrender to you. Okay, wow, this sounds awful. <laughs> this sounds awful. Who is this terrible person, this Nahash, king of the Amorites, that's going to be uh, gouging out everyone's right eye? That's just awful, awful. Well, let me tell you a little bit about this guy. We know a bit more about him than, than here. In this story, he just seems to spring out of nowhere. Uh, but he's also mentioned other places in the Bible, and, and specifically by some other historians. So, for instance, Josephus, who is a Jewish historian that's trying to explain the Jewish story to Rome, uh, who's, who's explaining it, he's ta he talks about this Nahash guy, and he says this is his usual practice. It's like, this is, this is the Nahash thing, you know. The, the, the right eye, I, can't even, I, don't, I didn't mean to act it out, sorry. This is disturbing. Uh, um, yeah, th this is just his, his usual practice. And, and it's great, but you know, Josephus is, is later on in, in, the, in history, um, quite a bit, by about a thousand years from this point. About a thousand, almost 1,100 years from this point. But also we discover in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found this, they found this, this written in the Dead Sea Scrolls in Cave 4, and it's the Dead Sea Scrolls, old, got it. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it later. But in this, in this copy of 1 Samuel, it explains King Nahash a little bit and what was going on a little bit more. And it, and it said this. It said, Nahash, king of Am Am Ammonites, would put hard pressure on the descendants of Gad and the descendants of Reuben and would gouge out everyone's right eye out, but no rescuer would be provided for Israel, and there was not left anyone among the children of Israel in the Transjordan. So that's on the other side of the river, uh, the other side of the Jordan River, uh, the east side, whose right eye, Nahash, the king of Amorites, did not gouge out. But behold, 7,000 men escaped the power of Ammonites, and they arrived at Yabesh Gilead. About a month later, Nahash, the Ammonite, went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. Okay, so we basically learned, there's a map here, uh, we basically learned that, um, that Nahash has, has, has been doing this for a while, and he's conquered all the, the tribal lands. So um, we're on the east side of the Jordan River, which is the blue line that goes up and down, we've got that, that's not a GPS thing. And so Ammon is, is further east, that's where he's king, and then Gad is there, in between there and the river, and then Reuben is, is south. So, so that dotted line is the tribe again. So he has conquered all this south side. Um, sorry, didn't mean, different south side. <coughs> and has worked his way up, uh, has worked his way up all the way, Jabesh Gilead's in, in red or maroon or, or whatever that color is. So he's, he's worked his way up uh, to there. And he's, so he's taken a huge bit of land and all, his whole practice has been gouging out all these people's right eyes. Uh, so awful, so, so disturbing. And I think compounding it, and that's one thing, okay, he's the enemy, he's bad, that's what bad guys do, right? Uh, but, then, but then you keep reading and you get to um, 1 Chronicles 19 and 2 Samuel chapter 10, and you find out this guy's David's friend. <laughs> what? What? And in fact, he, he dies, and, and David sends him a gift, uh, sent his family a gift because he'd shown kindness to David and his family. I, I don't, I, some, some of the, in the Jewish encyclopedia, they, they want to say, they say, well, it has to do with when David's family was needing to be hidden and, and taken care of. That, that David's family was being sheltered also a bit by this Nahash guy. But anyways, so they, there's, there's this connection there, and maybe it's just the enemy of my enemy sort of a thing. But... But yeah, that's, that's the story there. That's a little bit more on this, this name, Nahash guy. Really horrible seeming person. But let's keep reading and let's see what happens here. So verse 4, when messengers came to Gibeah, Saul's hometown, and told the terms to the people, uh, and told the term, that's right, and told the terms to the people, all wept aloud. Just then... Saul was coming in from the field behind, the, behind his oxen. 
what's the matter with the people? Why are they weeping? Saul inquired. And they repeated to him the words of the men of, from Jabesh. When Saul heard these words, the Spirit of God suddenly took control of him, and his anger burned furiously. He took a team of oxen, cut them in pieces, and sent them throughout the land of Israel by messengers who said, this is what will be done to the ox of anyone who does not march behind Saul and Samuel. As a result, the terror of the Lord fell on the people, and they, they went out united. Saul counted them at Bezek. There were 300,000 Israelites and 3,000 men from Judah. He told the messengers who had come, tell this to the men of Jabesh Gilead. Deliverance will be yours tomorrow by the time the sun is hot. So the messengers told the men of Jabesh and they rejoiced. <laughs> then the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, tomorrow we will come out and you can do whatever you want to us. The next day, Saul organized the troops into three divisions. During the morning watch, they invaded the Ammonite camp and slaughtered them until the heat of the day. There were survivors. There were survivors, but they were so scattered that no two of them were left together. <laughs> okay, I'm going to admit something to you. I'm going to admit two things. One, if you're going to talk about how to be a, a great church in our generation or a godly man or woman, this is probably not the first story you're going to run to. Uh, this one, let's talk about being a people who, who, who love God and follow God well. And also, honestly, I, I sat at my desk this week when looking at this passage for a couple hours. And I thought, okay, what does the next passage say? <laughs> what, where, where are we at? But then, you know, it's one of those, one of those times. It was, it was difficult. And I started praying through it. I'm like, okay, God, what is it that you want what, what, uh, to bring out here in this, in this story? I feel like God really all of a sudden opened my eyes to see some principles here that, that really apply when it comes to the kind of church that we want to be and, and, the, and the, um, the, the kind of people that we want to we be. So I want to talk about our call as Christians to, to love people and to help people who are hurting in crisis. The people of Jabesh Gilead, they have, they've run out of hope. And they're just a few days away from giving up and surrender. And you know that it's bad when the idea of giving up and surrender means everybody's losing an eye. Like that, you, you know that, that, that it's a pretty terrible place. There's a, that there, the hope level is at the bottom, okay? So it's not a decision that they're making lightly. Things look terrible in their lives. They don't have much hope. Um, probably because no rescuer has ever come a, as this guy has been sweeping through the whole east. And nobody has ever come to help. There's never been any defense, and pretty much everybody in the east, it says everybody in the east, but, but ha has lost an eye from this, from this guy. And, and no, no help and rescue has come. Everybody's been experiencing this pain and this humiliation. That's Nahash's aim, is to bring emotional humiliation to people, to humiliate them, to bring humilia humiliation to the nation. It said that in verse 2. In our area here in Glasgow, I, I know that... There's, there's places that, that, that people all over our areas are full of physical pain and or struggling with emotional pain. Emotional pain for, for, whatever, for whatever reason. Most people are, and I think if not everybody, at some point everybody will be experiencing physical pain and emotional pain. And I believe that's a huge reason why God is expanding our, our reach as a church, expanding our impact, putting us in a, in a few different locations um, because of, of God's heart and his compassion. That, that people in this city, when God looks over this land, he sees this, that people need help, that they need hope, that they need God's intervention in their, their lives. I think that's one of the reasons why we're here. But as you can see, there, there's, you look around, you're, there's no way we can help everybody. There's, there's no way we can have an impact with everyone. Um, again, the ancient writers, when they, when they write about this story, they, they, they talk about how everybody has, everybody has experienced humiliation in the East at this point. And Saul and the nation have done nothing as of yet. But it's different this time. In this story, it's different. Even though the, J the people of Jabesh Gilead aren't expecting it, it's different this time. Why is it different this time? Well, it said, it said why, and it said because the Spirit of God 
suddenly took control of Saul. That's, that's what made the difference in this moment. The Spirit of God suddenly took control of Saul. And it said in verse 6, when Saul heard these words, the Spirit of God suddenly co- took control of him, and his anger burned furiously. So today we're going to talk about Spirit-led helping. Spirit-led helping. We can't help everyone, but we, we must help everyone that God's Spirit nudges us to, to help. Jesus didn't help everyone. There's still sick people and blind people and lame people in the Apostles' Day in Jerusalem for the next several years. He doesn't help everyone. Uh, but the question that we need to keep wrestling with when we, when we discover that someone is in a, in a place of, of hurting or, or pain or whatever is, is the Spirit leading me to help this person in front of me? Is God's Spirit leading me to, to make a difference in this person's life? And, and how would you know that? How would you know the answer to that? Well, oftentimes, God's Spirit leads in our compassion and our emotion a lot of times. Uh, Jesus, oftentimes when you see him about to do a work, uh, to say something or to do something, it's, it will say the words, it'll say the words, <coughs> moved with compassion. And Jesus was, was filled with compassion, moved with compassion. Oftentimes, God's Spirit just gives you a, a heart, uh, some compassion for someone who, who is hurting. And, and sometimes it, that heart tries to get crushed out by, well, I can't help everybody. I can't do everything. But he'll give you compassion for, for a certain situation or, or a, a few people right in front of you. And not only has God made you aware of them, and not only has he put them in your path, he's given you a heart. He's given you compassion for them. So sometimes God gives you compassion for someone, and that's, that's part of his, the way that he leads. Sometimes, like here in, in uh, Saul's situation, <coughs> uh, and, and Jesus as well, Jesus says things out of the emotion of, of holy anger. Saul is, is, is acting here in holy anger. Jesus doesn't, uh, the Lazarus story, there's a lot of holy anger there. There's the, the whip out of cords, or three cords, temple driving out thing. Jesus is, is, is um, working uh, uh, the, the will of God in, out of the emotion of, of holy anger. Uh, be careful with that. Uh, but that, that's about injustice and justice and evil. So Saul is experiencing this with the raising of his army. Now, <clears throat> I know people who have been filled with right holy anger and they have quit their jobs and they have gone to war they've given up their they've given up their 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 own personal path of success and they've gone to war against human trafficking they're like i <clears throat> the injustice in me is so strong about about the, the evil that's going on in our world i'm going to take a different life path the whole the spirit has come on me and it gives me a righteous um, not okay, that's a righteous anger to, to spend my life doing, doing, uh, doing something about this in my city or in my, in my nation to free modern slaves. <clears throat> this isn't the only question, but we're surrounded by people who, who God has given us compassion for. But the question is, is the Spirit of God stirring up in you compassion or anger or some other, uh, some other motivating emotion to help someone or someone's in their suffering to help someone or someone's in their suffering <clears throat> i don't know what's normal for you uh for for many people apathy is the normal self-protective excuses for doing nothing is the normal and when you start to care and when you start to become aware Very often, God is behind that work of of you receiving God's heart for the person in front of you. So what happens here? Well, well Saul is filled with anger, and he goes from farmer to, okay, again, that's an an observation point. Why is he he still working his fields? Like we said before, they hailed all hail the king, but there's not enough of the nation behind him yet at this point. Okay, he's still he's still working. He's not able to be the 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 king yet. Uh, he's not. They're not all on the same page yet. So, anyways, he goes from farmer in this moment to commander, and he threatens the entire nation uh, to, to 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 butcher their their oxen, and it works. Uh, they be, they believed him, I guess, and they they all turned out to to go to war. And I think that there's an important lesson here. I want you to com- 
compare, you know, for many of you have been in Bible read-through groups here, if you're new here visiting, um, we, we tend to read through the Bible cover to cover every year in small groups all throughout the city, uh, groups of about six, eight, ten people, just reading it through cover to cover and, and just finding, yeah, the encouragement there from God. And, and if you want to be a part of Bible read-through group, you can go to the new here thing at the back. But I know a lot of you have been a part of uh, Bible read-through groups. And uh, so compare two people in their anger, two, two, men, two, two people who are serving God in their anger. So you've got Saul here, and then you've got Samson. Samson. And they're, in the, they're around the same time. In fact, um, th- they, their lives probably overlap. Their, their lives probably overlap here. Samson goes in his anger, and he fights alone. And he makes a big dent. I mean, he makes, he makes a, a big impact. Saul mobilizes people. He mobilizes the whole nation to bring help and doesn't, and doesn't uh, just go alone and try and help them. Oh, actually, Samson's dead at this point. Yes, Samson's dead. Uh, he's alive in Samuel's lifetime. So Samson goes on and fights alone in his anger. Saul mobilizes. I want number two, mobilizing help. One of the ways we help is to be a bit more like Saul than, than like Samson. O- over the years, I've seen different cycles of staff teams here at the church. And one of the things I try and keep reminding myself as, as, I, as we bring in new, new staff is to let everybody know their ministry limits or our ministry limits. I've got limits. We've all got limits. And, and maybe, maybe it's true. We have seven years of, of, of ministry training. It, I still have major limits in how far and what I can do and how far I can help somebody before it, it needs to, it's just beyond me. And so I tell my staff, love people well, love people well, be concerned, pray for people, pray for people expecting God's work and miracles, uh, pray for them, and, and then know your limits, and your limits are lower than you want them to be. Your limits are lower than you want them to be, and so the best thing that you can do as God's people is pray and pray for miracles, and then help the person get the real help. Help guide them to the place that they they need to go. Direct them to where they can get the help. And that makes sense, right? It makes sense. But stupid pride gets in the way. And we all hold on a bit too long in the Samson-like ministry before we get to the Saul-like ministry. I mean, I I can't speak for everyone. But that's that's the norm. That's the norm. Where where we're going to say, I'm going to do this myself until we are well past our own capacity limits, and it would have been better served to mobilize people sooner, to, to help and to bring the care. So let's say, let's say, for example, someone comes up to you and they suffer with uh, panic attacks. And I'm using this as an example because, you know, I, many, many of you know I, I have panic attack issues. So, um, so someone comes up to you and they're just, they're just broken with panic attacks, and you listen to their story, you're like, oh, that's, that's terrible, I, I'm, I'm so sorry. Now, let's say this person's name is Brian, just for, just for random, random name out. Uh, so this person's name is Brian, and Brian comes up to you, and, and he says, oh, you know, I'm just, I just really suffer with panic attacks, it's a nightmare. And you're like, oh dear, that sounds terrible. And, and on the inside, you feel something. You feel <laughs> compassion. You feel compassion for, for Brian, or you feel anger. You feel anger that, that this is happening to, to Brian, and, 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 and you're, you're upset about this. And so you get a sense, okay, God is stirring up your emotions to do something about this. It was a heart to help me. I mean, Brian, to help Brian out there. And so what, you, what you're going to do is you're going to be like, okay, God, give me your heart for this person. And you're going you're gonna to pray, God, I just pray for your, your healing and miracles. And, and maybe just depending on the situation, you might be like, okay, I, I think there's some, some uh, demonic stuff going on here. Or whatever the case may be. And, you, and you're gonna, you can do that kind of ministry there. But let's say that God doesn't immediately answer via miracle. Most of you are not trained... <laughs> To be able to help someone, Brian, with um, panic attacks, and and so we got to think, we got to get past, or, or we got to be honest with our own limits, and 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 just be like, okay, how can I mobilize help for this person? Uh, th- I, I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to pray for miracles for this person. 
but, and I'm going to listen to them, and I'm going to give them my best advice and all that kind of stuff, but where, how can I help them? So here's some examples of how you could help Brian. You could say, you could take Brian to the elders, James chapter 5. You could say, elders, anoint this person with oil and, and pray for them so, so that he may be healed. That's, that's one thing that you can do. You can try and get that together. And Brian's like, no, I'm afraid of the elders. They're, they're, they're tall and, 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 and I don't know. Uh, yeah, no, no, we're going to, I'll go with you. It's okay. Um, uh, ironically, there's issues, you know, if you have fear issues, sometimes moving forward on things is, is scary. So, we're gonna, okay, do that. Um, another thing that you could do with somebody like Brian, you could be like, okay, Brian, uh, let's set up an appointment with your GP. And, and I'm going to keep praying for you for miraculous healing, but let's set up an appointment with you and your GP, and I can even take you there if, if, you know, and, see if, and see if your GP thinks you need medication. Mobilizing help. How, how can you be helping it's when it's beyond you? Um, maybe, maybe you're going to be like, okay, Brian, um, you, you need therapy. You need counseling. I am going to, uh, depending on the situation, I'm going to pay for you to get counseling or, or therapy in, in this situation. Okay, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. Um, maybe I'm going to mobilize a group of people to pray and intercede for God's breakthrough in your life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get, I'm going to gather a group of, of, of five to ten people. See, those are ways you can start mobilizing um, help for somebody that's far beyond you. When you're going from a, a Saul-like mobilizing, you're going to a Saul-like mobilizing as opposed to a Samson-like. I'm going to be the hero. Most of the time, God is bringing people into your life not to be their hero, but their guide. We want to be the hero. Well, technically, Jesus and God in, in his miraculous power is the hero. But very often, it's to be the guide who helps them walk the path, to walk with them towards uh, getting the help that they need. Uh, so if you really want to make a difference, if you want to make a difference in the place that God's put us, know what you can do. Know what your limits are. And, and the limits are lower than you might think. I think typical limits that tend to throw people off is things like depression. Depression is, is complicated, it's complex, it's probably beyond most of our skill set. Just know where our limits are. Pray, pray hard, but then help them get to the help that they need. Okay, so we said here that we are here for spirit-led helping. Where, when's the Holy Spirit leading me to help this person? To mobilize help, and then also in this passage we can see this, communicating hope. Communicating hope. He, he's in verse 9, I think, it, it talks about how he, he told the messengers, let me see, 9, 9, 9, yes. He told the messengers who had come, tell this to the men of Jabesh Gilead, deliverance will be yours tomorrow by the time the sun is hot. So the messengers told the men of Jabesh and they rejoiced, okay? Very simple, but this communication of hope. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but I hope you have. Maybe you've been feeling in a low place. Uh, that's not what I hope. <laughs> But you've been sitting across the table from someone, or you've been on the phone with someone, and you've been feeling low and discouraged and, 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 and feeling hopeless, and they have said something to you that's encouraged you. They have said something to you that's given you hope. Like, it, this is not going to go on forever. This is a season. You are not alone in this moment. You're not alone. Jesus is with you. I'm with you. God is real, and he's paying attention. You may feel like God is not paying attention, but he is paying attention, and he loves you. Or you'll start hearing words of hope, or even if things are, 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 are crumbling right now, and you have very real hope in Jesus for eternity, for eternity, and it's going to be good, and maybe that doesn't seem consoling right now, but it ought to be. If it's not, it's because we're not grasping the reality of just how fantastic time what Jesus is going to be. And you start filling people with, with messages of hope. When we, when we look at what Jesus has done and accomplished and God's great love for us and his concern for us, we have so much hope to offer anybody in any situation, in any crisis. We're like ambassadors of hope. We're messengers of hope. We're, we, we, have, we have just powerful hope. Hope for today and for those who believe in Jesus, just hope for eternity. We're, we're announcers of hope. So communicating hope, huge, a huge reason why we're here. <laughs> a church 
about hope, church, regarding hope, we encourage you. Well, here the story goes on, and, and so that's kind of the setup. And then there's the conclusion here of the story in verse, in uh, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 12. And, and we're going to see some God-given rewards for obeying, for, um, for following the Spirit-led leading here. Afterward, the people said to Samuel, who said that Saul should not reign over us? Give us those men so that we can kill them. But Saul ordered, no one will be executed on this day, for today the Lord has provided deliverance in Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, come, let's go to Gilgal so we can renew the kingship there. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there in the Lord's presence, they made Saul king. There, there they sacrificed fellowship offerings in the Lord's presence. And Saul and all the men of Israel greatly rejoiced. Okay, so when we do what the Spirit is leading us to do, no matter how complicated, when, when we do what the Spirit is leading us to do, and we do that boldly, good things can result. For Saul, there are four special things that resulted, and you may experience some of these four things when you set out to follow God well and follow that Spirit-led compassion. First thing that he experiences is a lifelong, his lifelong calling, life calling is confirmed and established. Some of you are like, God, what do you want me to do with my life? Follow the nudges, and you'll find out. God is leading you, and he may not say, this is what I want you to do, but he'll say, do this little thing. Care for this person. Love this person. And along the way, you'll be like, this is what I'm made to do. I'm loving it. I've discovered what God wants me to be doing with my life. Like, I know we want to hear it all at first, but sometimes your calling gets confirmed as you just follow the next leading, and then the next one, as you humble yourself in this situation, as you follow this nudge. For Saul, he's confirmed to be king. They made Saul king. And I guess the, the Samuel stuff, the prophet, you're going to be king, didn't quite work <laughs> enough. And so uh, following the nudges did. So we can go from farmer to king. The, the second thing is that the result is God is worshipped just because he's good and he's still at work. They do a fellowship offering here in this passage, which is just a God, we, we're thankful. We, we love you. God gets praised in worship. That's why we have the share time. That, like anything that you want to say about what God's done in your life, it's because we want God to, to, to be celebrated and, and thanked and, and receive praise when, when, when good things happen. So um, the third thing that we see in this passage after this victory is all the people are happy and rejoicing. When you do what God wants you to do, he shows up. And, and he brings healing, he brings help, he brings freedom, he brings rescue. And when he does, when that kind of stuff happens and lives are changed, happy to be there. When lives are changed and people go from broken and ho feeling hopeless to, to just lift, that their spirit's lifted and full of life and joy, ah, oh, happy day. So those are the three obvious one here, but there's a fourth one. There's a fourth thing that's less obvious. And it happens sometimes. Uh, it happens sometimes, not, not always, but when we push ourselves to love people well, again, it's not immediately obvious in the story, but they might be there for you someday. Fourth one, fourth thing. They might be there for you someday. Now I'm just going to give you a quick insight into the future here. Forty years into the future from this moment. Forty years in the future. Saul is going to be fighting a battle, and he's shot with an arrow, and, and he knows he's not going to make it, and he's on Mount Gilboa, and he's going to die. And the, the witch told him the other day, it's a long story, the witch of Endor, not Star Wars, uh, told him he's going to die. And so he's got shot with an arrow, and, and then he f he's like, okay, I'm going to die. He falls on his spear. Oh, I don't need to talk about it. We'll get there. He dies. Okay, and what happens is the next day the Philistines come along and they find his body there and they find his three sons' bodies there. And so they take Saul and, and they chop off his head and they take his armor into the, to, to in their temple, their foreign temples, and they spike his body onto the walls of, of Beit Shan. Like, and, and just kind of like a, a and his son's body. They, they spike them onto the walls. Well, it is the men of Jabesh Gilead. The men of Jabesh Gilead, this place, they march through the night 
and they go to this really fortified city, a major fortified city. They go to this fortified city, and thousands of them, 12,000 or so, they take his body and his son's body off the spikes on the wall, and through the night, they, they take him away back to Jabesh Gilead, and they, they burn the body so that they can't be humiliated anymore, and they bury their bones. He gets buried in Jabesh Gilead. Sometimes, when you make a difference in your life, we don't do this for any reward. We don't do this for any kickback. We don't, we're not doing this so that people will like us. We're doing this because God's just nudging us. But sometimes, when you go out and you love people well for God, when your day comes, some of them will love you well in return. And if not those people, God is able to nudge others to love you because you were someone that was loving others. And I, and I know what it's like. I, you, you, you love people well, and then it, it goes bad, and, and they don't love you back when your time comes, and it hurts, and it stings sometimes. And you, you, sometimes you get to the point, I just want to give up on people, you know, because I've loved them well, and, and I'm not being loved back well. Just don't give up. Just trust God with the love back thing. Just trust God with that. And, and if it's not one of these people that you've really poured yourself into loving well, you release them to God and let God release people to you, even different people, when, you, when your time comes. Just like God is going to nudge you to love people in their moment, he's going to nudge people to love you in yours. And all I want in our church is for us to all be sensitive to when is God nudging me and, and, and when is he nudging me to help this person. Because I think that many of us have experienced nudges over the years and ignored them. But let's awaken to that. Let's be more awake and alive to, am I being nudged to love people well? There's no way that you can make a difference in, in our generation if when you see people hurting, you're going to move towards apathy. You're just not going to make a difference. It's not until you, you encounter challenging situations and you get your hands dirty and you set your heart to loving them well with the love that God gives you. When you enter and you start helping uh, situations which where, where people are feeling without hope. And maybe you look at the situation like, it's so beyond me. It's, again, it's not your job to be the hero, but you can help them find the path. You can pray for them and help them find the way out. I want to be a church that really makes a difference. That makes a difference. That we're here, not just for this facility, but for this, this whole area. That, that's, that's there in the West. Not for that facility, but for that whole area. I believe that you're here. I believe that you're a part of this church for what God is going to do in your life but also so that you can make a massive impact by loving people well. We're going to have some, I have some challenges for you today, a, little, a few reflection challenges. Challenge number one is, is the Spirit leading you to care for, for uh, or love a particular person? Uh, like, have, as I'm sitting there talking and you're like, but I don't want to love them, and yet I'm feeling pulled towards loving them, but I don't want to love them. I'm going to guess it's probably not you. It could, be, it could be God. It could also be some guilt thing. But if you, probably God, if you want wisdom on this, you can, you can uh, go for prayer. You can go for prayer and say, God, you know, I've got a good idea what that answer might be, but we'll, we can go for prayer there. Secondly, if you're helping someone and their people, uh, and their people you can mobilize or and there are people. Uh, what is going on here? So somebody, no, no. It's okay, team. We're going to roll with this today. Uh, if you're helping someone, are there people you can mobilize or guide them to for help? And who would those be? Don't worry. It's the wrong there. I know. I get it. Is there anybody you can help with grammar? Uh, someone, Brian. Uh, if you're helping someone... Are there people you can mobilize? Uh, thirdly, have you been helping someone for a while and need recharged yourself? Or want to see breakthrough on their behalf? If you, you, can, you can go to prayer ministry today and say, I, I am feeling empty. I've poured myself out. And that happens. And we want to be, want to be careful. Make sure as you're helping people that you have your own life support structures in place. People who are praying for you and encouraging you and, 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 uh, and pouring into you. 
But if you're feeling empty, go for prayer.